Well, hello and welcome to the DC Today, where today is Wednesday, January 18th, where Pacifica Christian is number three in all of Orange County and where the market today got hammered. Um, It's an interesting point in the market that I want to spend most of our time talking about today because you have had these, you know, 500, 600 point down days over the last year that almost exclusively. Um, I would have to go back and check if there's anything I'm missing, but almost exclusively were related to some form of the inflation fed narrative. And that is to say you could have had the market down a lot when CPI came in higher than expected one day, or when the fed talked tougher one day, or when the fed tightened more than expected or telegraphed more tightening than expected. You know, these various things that kind of took place largely throughout, um, the spring of 22 through the end of the year. Uh, or through let's let's call it um, the fall. I think that the market's issue today, to a lesser degree, yesterday, is now in the other side of the narrative. And you and you might be thinking with, with some rationale, what's the difference? Who cares why you know a market down a bunch it feels the same? Keep in mind the market had been up a bunch and and it's still up on the year so far in these first couple of weeks that we've been open. But a lot of these gains that we're getting pretty heavy uh, have come back in the last couple of days. And yet it's not related. Uh, The bond market's rallying like crazy. Bond yields are dropping. Um, And that's up and down the term uh, structure. So the yield curve um, is moving lower. And at the same time, uh, there's this ambiguity in the stock market. So what does that mean? Because it clearly doesn't mean people are trying to price in more Fed tightening when, first of all, the Fed is about to take a looser posture, not a tighter posture, but also the bond market saying the exact opposite. What it is referring to is economic weakness. And in a way, someone who doesn't like it when bad news is supposed to be considered good news and good news is supposed to be considered bad news and thinks that that represents a sort of distortion to reality. Um, that is, to me, this is a positive development, even if it's a negative effect in markets for a bit. So what do I mean by concerns about the economy? Well, first of all, the Dow was down and a lot of it came in the outer half of the day. Um, but the Dow was down 614 points today, 1.8%. The S&P was down 1.6%. The NASDAQ was down one and a quarter. And at the same time, the bond market rallied big. I mean, this is a stunning fact that the 10-year bond yield is back to 3.37%. It was down 16 basis points today. So how's that for long-term inflation expectations? Um, the best performing sector in the market was communication services. It was down almost 1%. The worst was consumer staples, which was down 265 Pretty brutal hit in the consumer staples sector. Crude was down a percent, but it's still sticking right around that $80 mark. So first what happened this morning was futures rallied quite nicely uh, pre-market when the producer price index came out. And what happened was um, PPI was expected to drop 0.1%, so that would still be disinflationary, but it dropped 0.5% on the month. This is a sequential drop. From November to December, prices dropped half a percent. And so that is what you call deflation. Um, Now, uh, November's number was adjusted downwards as well. So the PPI number went lower in November than anticipated. And then on a year-over-year basis, um, you saw the PPI up 6.2%, and it had been up 74 So you now see disinflation year-over-year, year, uh, significantly so in CPI and, and uh, to some degree in PPI, which is producer price inputs or, or, or uh, wholesale prices versus consumer prices. Now, wholesale gas prices dropped 13% in the month of December. That certainly helped. But the food index was down over 1%. Um, You you have a number of things uh, that are leading in that regard. And the reason the markets moved higher was that, again, reinforced expectation that 
well, if uh, these inflationary numbers are all coming down, the Fed is even closer and no reason to get all caught up on it. So far, so good. I think it's a, a, good, a good way of looking at how things were uh, unfolding. Then what all of a sudden caused the markets to pivot? A couple hours later, the industrial production number comes out. And you are talking about a 0.7% drop in December alone, not year over year, one month, which really, because there was 0.3% additional downward revisions from prior months, you're actually talking about a 1% drop in industrial production from where we had thought we were, manufacturing being the biggest contributor to that decline. This is the largest monthly decline in over a year. And on an annualized basis, industrial production is down 5.2% in the last three months. That is brutal. So you add to that things like a very large software company, uh, Microsoft, announcing 10,000 layoffs, laying off 5% of their workforce. Uh, retail sales had fallen in December 1.1%. That does mostly refer to the disinflation I'm referring to, particularly gas prices being lower. It led to a, high, a lesser number in, in retail sales. Nevertheless, downward pressure in terms of economic strength and activity. Um, my, I want to talk real briefly about Bank of Japan and the Fed. Um, but my my big takeaway here is that the economic weakness narrative is very possibly about to replace the Fed inflation narrative. Uh, the good news of that is it means you're all the closer to that inevitable point of markets pricing in um, the bad news and moving on to the next. Uh, but I, I continue to believe that the right play is humility around expectations of what happens in the economy because there is increased talk about soft landing. And and then now there is increased talk about some of the economic weakness that is clearly present. All this stuff has been there for us for some time. It's not new information that manufacturing is weak, industrial production is weak, and those things could get weaker. And I think we live with this idea. There's a lot of vulnerability in business investment, capital expenditures, the investments into future productivity that are necessary to feel good about economic growth and economic activity. Yet the job market, wages, all the other stuff we've talked about continuing to hold in there. Nothing's really changed in that tension. And so I'm all for not being overly confident in an economic outlook in 23. But that doesn't mean that we can't see, you know, the market may be responding to it at a given point in time. Um, where it pans out is where it pans out. And I do find it mostly immaterial to what we believe about managing capital, but I'm trying to give you some context and explanation for the day-to-day -day movements in the market. I mentioned I wanted to quickly say something about, um, oh, oh, just real quickly on the market. I'm sorry. This is, I got to make sure I'm reading this right. 65 days. I typed this myself about 12 hours ago, or let's see, 10 hours ago. Um, the market's low, let's call it the S&P 500. The market's low... Um, in this cycle was October the 12th and it has not re-hit that low and really it's quite a bit above it. I mean, it's pretty significant. Um, and that now is 65 trading days since October 12th. And so you've gone 65 days without making a new low and people are wondering, is this a sign technically speaking that the market won't make a new low? What do we make of it? And of course the answer is who knows and who cares? Why would how many days it's been above a number of anything to do with what it ends up doing at some point going forward. But I do think that there is um, this concept of, of market of prior market bottoms representing kind of reference point for where we go. And I, I think it's highly unlikely that you get both of the things at once that can disrupt markets. And that would be, Fed substantially tightening and surprisingly tightening at the same time, the economy and weakness substantially worsening relative to expectations. And I think those two things are now in conflict with one another. And so therefore it puts a certain floor as to how low things can go. But of course that floor can be taken out if global recessionary fears are worse than expected. 
the China reopening uh, uh, thesis is why I'm not a big believer in that idea. But some erosion of U.S. corporate profits, it's worse than expected. Some changing, uh, uh, some deterioration of what is right now quite healthy labor markets. Um, there's a lot of things that could happen. Uh, I do continue to wonder when I see not only uh, some of the stock market weakness over the last year and what we know uh, in terms of kind of valuations and and so forth uh, in the tech sector, but then now the fundamentals of where the the bulk of the job layoffs are there. They're in Silicon Valley. They're in tech. Um, there's a part of me that just feels a certain rhyme, not an identical experience, but to the inflation, excuse me, the, the recession that we went through at an earlier stage of my investing career um, where there was a recession and it was really quite isolated to a certain group in the aftermath of the dot-com blow up. And I don't know that that thesis I've thrown out there for oh, over a year now, I don't know that I'd dismiss it. I, I think there may be something there. I'm not ready to, you know, declare uh, uh, victory or, or grade myself an A on some kind of a call, but that thesis is out there. And so, uh, again, a number of things up in the air with the economy. I mentioned Bank of Japan. This was, I don't think I have any data I got to share here. But last night, yeah, the 10 year, um, they have put kind of caps in that they're not going to let it go higher than 50 basis points, a 0.5% rate on their 10 year bond. And they more or less announced that they're going to leave that there where they were expected they might increase the cap, which is part of their yield curve control policy. So people thinking, oh, yeah, the Bank of Japan's about to capitulate. Uh, they're going to have to go the other way and not be so accommodating and instead try to tighten. And again, their central bank saying, no, we don't have to do that. No, we're not. And so they maintained that 10, that, uh, 10 year level. Um, why? It's 100% fiscal, 100% Bank of Japan is the um, accomplice to their ability to, to run debt to GDP of about 250%. To run huge deficits, they need um, a fiscal, a monetary accomplice to their fiscal uh, activities. And I guess I would ask you why our Fed uh, would not be at some point in the same boat. I'll leave you to think about that on your own. Uh, by the way, the Fed, uh, James Board, is trying to carve out his niche as the most hawkish Fed member. He did say, to Nick Timiros at the Wall Street Journal today that he anticipates they want to get to 5.5%, keep going and leave it there a long time. Uh, he tends to be a bit of an outlier. I, I don't hear other Fed governors talking the same way, but I want to throw it out there that that's what Fed Governor James Bullard said of St. Louis. That's all I got for today's DC Today. Bad couple of days in the market. We come back tomorrow, Thursday, and please do send, send any questions you have on any topic to questions at thebonsongroup.com. Thank you for listening to and watching the DC Today.